What's crazy is Backlash was here in my stomping grounds, Richmond, Virginia. I could have just hopped right down Broad Street and went to the Coliseum and watched Backlash. And it's really an indictment on the way I feel about the WWE product and, frankly, the wrestling business as a whole. They had absolutely no interest in doing so, no desire in doing so. I barely had any desire to actually check out this pay-per-view. But check out this pay-per-view that I did. I had a couple of people that I worked with that actually did go. One guy was able to get tickets on StubHub at the last minute. They were nosebleeds, granted, but I think he said he paid like $4 a pop. Four bucks a pop to get into a pay-per-view. That's crazy. And that's not necessarily a good thing. That tells you about the relative lack of demand for the WWE product, in my opinion. But nonetheless, with the brand split, now that means more pay-per-views, which, of course, gives me a whole different level of trepidation, whole different level of fear, a product that is already overexposed, you're going to overexpose even more and diminish the significance of the special events by damn near doubling the amount of them that you have in a year from, let's say, 12 to 19. And Lord only knows that come in the future, if as they continue to go into this brand split, there could very well be two pay-per-views a month. There literally could be one every two weeks, and I'd be frankly stunned if that's not the direction WWE eventually went with this. So this shit, frankly, could get old very, very quickly, even if the product was good. The product is not good, therefore it makes it even worse. But ultimately, since they've done the brand split, and even before that, I really haven't cared about SmackDown, haven't watched SmackDown, haven't checked out SmackDown. So if anything, I was hoping, heading into this show, that it would give me a freshen perspective because I wouldn't be jaded about it because in some ways... I'd be somewhat trying to figure out what the hell is going on at the same token. I'd just be able to kind of watch the show and give my thoughts about the show without a whole lot of preconceptions about what was going on heading into the actual show. So I tell you what, let's go ahead and talk about Backlash, huh? With the brand split, it in theory creates more opportunities for more individuals. And as a direct result, you have to create some new titles. You have to give some of the people on the other show something to fight for, give them some type of purpose. So the WWE, from the very beginning of this night, was setting out about the nasty business of giving the ladies of SmackDown something to work towards, something to fight over, and that was the Women's Championship. And now we're going to crown the first SmackDown Women's Champion. Yeehaw! It's a six-pack challenge elimination match. Whoopity-skippity. Now, I was sitting here watching this, and I'm like, okay... You know, you're giving these ladies a chance. They gave the match plenty of time. You know, sometimes just because you give a match a lot of time doesn't make it a good thing. Doesn't mean that it really makes the match work or not. Um, I kind of, it, it is what it is when it pertains to this. You only had like six full matches on this card. So, you know, the matches were naturally going to get some time. At least you gave these ladies a chance to get over. Uh, what I was really puzzled by was... You've got Carmella, who was associated with Amore and Cassidy down at NXT, and she got over with that crowd that way. So instead of bringing her up to the main roster and associating them her with those two and getting her over that way, the WWE went in this odd direction of making her something entirely different, what, for the purpose of giving Nikki Bella something to do? Like, I really honestly thought heading into this match, when they announced who the six people were, I really thought Nikki Bella was going to pull some backstage power political play and she was going to walk out of here with the belt. She didn't, but it was hard to know that when you're watching the match. Like, so much of the emphasis and the focus was on Nikki Bella and Carmella, Nikki Bella and Carmella, Carmella, Nikki Bella, that you forgot that the person who, frankly did absolutely nothing of any kind in this match, Becky Lynch, ended up winning the Women's Championship. And it's like, what's the priority here? Are you trying to get Nikki Bella over and what she's doing over? Or are you trying to get your Women's Champion over? You know, Becky Lynch has been around for a little bit. People recognize her. People like her. Why not put some shine on her? I was really disappointed with the lazy way they did this and the fact that Becky Lynch didn't do shit until the very, very end. And that's 
a tired tradition of the WWE in these multi-people championship matches. The person that actually wins, they're like, well, they get all the shine from winning at the end. Well, you got to give them a reason to win that title. You actually got to give them a purpose here, and you've got to make them do something. And coming out of this, it felt like even though this was Becky Lynch's moment and she won the belt, that it was more important what Nikki Bella was doing with fucking Carmella. So let me get this straight. We go from Zack Ryder getting a well-deserved WrestleMania moment to now he's in a tag team called the Hype Bros with Mojo Rowley that screams jobber team to oblivion all over the place. Whatever. And apparently now, fuck if I knew, the Usos are heels, so let me get this straight. You tried to help Roman get over as a face by aligning the Usos with him and hoping that they would rub off on him. Instead, the exact opposite happened. He rubbed off on them to where you took a lot of the shine and luster off of them as baby faces, and you have now tried to flip their characters and make them into guys that we want to hate. I guess... And this is a challenge with the Usos when you got this twin tag team. There's really only so much you can do with them because I don't know how much it's going to work if you ever pull them apart and work them as singles, guys. Now, granted, with the brand split, you can eliminate at least some of the confusion by putting naturally one on one show and one on the other show. But, you know, before you do that, you had to sit here and do some type of character turn, do something different with them, I suppose. I don't know if I'm down with it. I don't know if I'm not down with it. You know, they go over the Hype Brothers here, and it's just kind of, eh, whatever. While he may look like Gollum, my precious, and his wife looks like she just got off of a cocaine lace chocolate cake bender, I think sometimes I don't do a good enough job of emphasizing how valuable I think The Miz is to the WWE product. I know many hardcore fans don't necessarily get down with him because he's not their type of dude, whatever the case might be. But this is a guy that actually has a rare talent. And it comes somewhat natural to him. People just naturally don't like him. He's got that douche factor to him. He is a bit of a douche. And it's cool because it is who he is, and it works for him. And what I appreciate about The Miz is that he can actually – get the right type of reaction and get people to actually hate him to where you feel like he's one of the few guys that the WWE intends for you to want to pay money to see him get his ass kicked and people would actually maybe pay money to see him get his ass kicked. And I always feel like he works tremendously well as a mid-card type of champion. U.S. title, IC title, doesn't matter. Whenever he's the mid-card champion, that belt is elevated instantly. It always means more. It does. Don't pay respect to him. Don't give him his props on that. Whatever you want to do. But you're just fucking wrong. Because when he has the mid-card title, it means more. The company presents it differently. They package it differently. They package, as a result, the champion differently. They do a lot of good things. Now, I do caution the WWE on this. This path that they're going down with him and Daniel Bryan. If this is going to culminate in some major match, or let's say at WrestleMania 33, then okay, so be it. Because those two guys have always had really good chemistry. There is a very natural storytelling element built in on so many different levels that you really don't have to work hard. Yes, it's a match we've seen before, but it's a match we can go through seeing again. And it feels like, in theory, the type of mid-card WrestleMania grudge match that every good WrestleMania show should have. If, you, if that's where you're going with this, then great. But I don't know that they're really where you're going with this. So all this shit you're teasing between Miz and Daniel Bryan could end up being a colossal circle jerk waste of time and a big distraction away from the Miz focusing on other things. Now, if you're trying to use him and Daniel Bryan and use Daniel Bryan as a heater to get the Miz hated, so be it. But isn't that what you have Maurice for? You use her in a certain way to make her the heater for the Miz to where the Miz on several different levels can get even more heel heat. Frankly, he's a guy that can already get heel heat naturally. Anyways, again, one of the few guys in the company that actually can. He's very expert at that. He's very skilled at that, even if people don't want to pay him respect. I just caution the company, don't tease something if you're not going to do it. And maybe they are. Maybe there's something we don't know. I just don't see what the point is because I don't see where this would happen. As far as this IC title match, what more can I say? 
At SummerSlam, Dolph Ziggler's wrestling for the WWE title. At Backlash, he's wrestling for the IC title. Hopefully in two months, he's wrestling on the goddamn pre-show, and eventually he's off fucking SmackDown. I know I asked too much, but at the end of the day, Miz retains, hooray, and can I get up? <laughs> Fuck Dolph Ziggler. I still don't understand what the thought process was behind the finish at SummerSlam. You know, there's a reason wrestlers used to blade themselves. Like, even raging marks for themselves like Bret Hart used to be very, very skilled at blading, but making it look like they were busted open the hard way. Now we're going out there and encouraging top talent to get busted open the hard way to for no real reason, and there's no real payoff to it, and then you get a fucking concussion, the company's trying to cover up the fact that their booking decision for the SummerSlam match was fucking stupid, that they put a marquee talent that they invested over a decade in at risk for ridiculous reasons, and again, very little to no payoff. So that way now, you're advertising the whole time heading into this show that it's going to be Randy Orton versus Bray Wyatt, and everybody knows that's watching this pay-per-view, because frankly, it's only hardcore fans watching this shit that he's not going to. So why would you sit there and continue to promote this? So he takes Randy Orton out, and here comes Kane. You know, Kane going over Bray Wyatt is bad on its own level. It doesn't get me, like, ragingly pissed, because frankly, does Bray Wyatt even matter at this point anymore? But this is the type of shit that we're talking about here that happens with Bray Wyatt that really, really prevents him from being what he can be. He's been around for over three years now, and he's in the same fucking spot he was three years ago. He's back wrestling Kane again. Just think about that. Wasn't it SummerSlam like 2013 he wrestled Kane? Some shit like that? Now in 2016 at Backlash, he's wrestling Kane again? Hey, let's think about this for a second. He's in the same fucking spot. Instead of taking a guy who has the chance to be very unique and very different and bring a different perspective and a different type of character to the table and the fans get behind that and they enjoy it and they're entertained by it and they want to cheer the guy, we continue to go against the grain every way possible to force people to boo him to where they don't want to boo him. Then you do a shitty job of booking him because he never really goes over in a way that really matters at a time that really matters against opponents that really matter. So eventually the people stop caring about him. And that's where you're at with Bray Wyatt. You've taken a guy that should be a top guy for you and made him an irrelevant mid-carder stuck in mid-card hell. And that's the thing. Is Kane going over Bray Wyatt should be one of those shoots a flame up my ass type of get me pissed off and rant and rave moments. And it just isn't. Because they've done so much to fuck up this Bray Wyatt character this is just another feather in the cap of the WWE. Why get worked up about it? Because who gives a shit? Clearly the company doesn't. And frankly, I think we're at the point that a lot of the fans don't either. Back in June of 2010, an eight-person faction called the Nexus debuted on Raw and laid waste to everyone and everything that night. Now just think about this for a quick second. A little over six years later, out of those eight people, four of them... Wade Barrett, Skip Sheffield, Ryback, Justin Gabriel, Michael Tarver, no longer with the company. One of them, Daniel Bryan, was with the group for that one show, pretty much. But with that said, he's the one that went on to main event or WrestleMania. All the while now, was forced to retire due to neck problems. He's, what, the general manager on SmackDown. Another one of the group's members, David Otunga, is now doing commentary on said SmackDown show. Out of those eight, the two guys that are still active in-ring competitors are Darren Young and Heath Slater. Ain't that some shit. Those are the last of the Mohicans, if you will. Now with that said, I, I just wanted to bring that up. Isn't that fucked up? And think about all the potential you thought that there was for some of the members in that group and how much of that talent was unrealized and potential unfulfilled. With all that said, I, I enjoyed what they were doing with Heath Slater here. 
you know, making this whole thing of trying to make him into a free agent and this whole pursuit of this title, his odd pairing with Rhino. I actually enjoyed this. This was fun shit. See, this is the type of shit you should be able to get on a SmackDown because you don't have the pressures of being on the flagship show Raw. You could be a little creative. You could be a little bit different. And, you know, SmackDown at times has had a tendency over the years to be able to do this type of stuff. This is the type of stuff that this show can do and do very well. You know, they're making people care about Heath Slater. They're kind of going on that Jamie Noble type of shit of, Ooh, want some money? We're going to Applebee's! You know, that type of shit. You know, Heath Slater wins his title. He's getting a double wide. Well, I want to see Heath Slater get a double wide for him and his kids, damn it. Now you got to make sure you follow that up down the road by actually shooting vignettes at his new double wide. When it's unveiled, when his family's moving in, this white trash shit they're doing, the beauty and the man beast thing. This is funny. Funny. Wrestling could be fun. And this is fun. So I geeked out just a little bit when he, Slater, and Rhino, of all people, won the fucking SmackDown Tag Team Championships. I thought it was a fun match. And the right guys won. <laughs> he, Slater's getting a double wide. I think we can all get down with that. One thing I want to see about out of guys as they progress in their careers is I want to see some actual progression. I want to see growth and improvement. Tangible points where you can say this is where they were, this is where they are going, this is where they are now, this is how much better they are compared to what they used to be. And I look at a guy like Dean Ambrose and, you know, for years people talk about John Moxley, John Moxley, he could be a big star. And I could see elements of where... Good old John Moxley, Dean Ambrose, can be a big star. It's frustrating, though, because he's basically the same guy he was four fucking years ago, and that's not a good thing. I see growth and improvement in Seth Rollins. Even though many of the butthurts won't agree, there is growth and improvement in Roman Reigns. But I don't know if it's just complacency I don't know if he's spending all of his time trying to doink average-looking Renee Young. Um, because he's obviously not using his time uh, on hair care products, washing his ass, or getting better at his craft. It's really frustrating because Dean Ambrose is a guy that should be one of those top guys that draws people's attention. He should be an interesting, captivating, compelling character. Because he's paid his dues, he's put in his time... There's a lot of elements there that suggest he should be something other than a colossal boar as champion. But as a world champion, a colossal boar he is. This guy that's supposed to be lunatic fridge takes no chances. This guy that's supposed to have this big reputation of being this good worker on the independent scene is lazy as fuck in the ring. I mean, time after time, you put Dean Ambrose in a marquee spot, and he has bad matches. And for so many of you, where the only thing you have now to grab onto with the WWE is the in-ring product, and for so many of you, where that's the only thing that freaking matters is the in-ring product, frankly, why the hell would any of you support Dean Ambrose? And, and frankly, based off of the reaction I heard from some of the Richmond crowd, some people were agreeing with me. There were smatterings of booze. Because Ambrose is boring as bricks. Let's face it. Yes, Roman Reigns is very, very boring. And frankly, I think Seth Rollins is too. But when we want to talk about boring, arguably the most boring member of the Shield is now Dean Ambrose. And I really don't know if it's close. Because at least if you don't like Roman Reigns, he can invoke a reaction out of you, which is what the WWE is in. They're in the reaction business. So your booing of him still gets the reaction that WWE craves, because it's a reaction of some kind. That's how fucked up and warped and twisted WWE and the business as a whole has gotten. But you look at Dean Ambrose, and he should be so much more than he is, and it's disappointing. And then you get AJ Styles to come along. And I give credit to AJ Styles. You know, instead of sitting there and, you know, extolling the virtues of a long, successful t for him TNA run and hanging on to that past legacy and going to make a money in Japan and on the independent scene, he wanted to test himself in the big time. And this is frankly the best that AJ Styles has ever been. So I'm really excited for him, 
that he was able to successfully carry Dean Ambrose's lazy in-ring ass to a really good world title match here. And AJ Styles is now truly the face that runs the place. He is the SmackDown champion. He is the WWE champion. How crazy is that? The face of TNA for a decade plus is now the face that runs the place of the WWE that has the company's most important title. And it's well-earned and well-deserved. Now, maybe this type of moment should have happened at a SummerSlam, but he was too busy beating John Cena clean in the match of the night at SummerSlam. I mean, he beat Cena clean. No bullshit. You know, maybe the only thing you question about what they've done with AJ Styles is that they had him lose to Jericho at Mania. But even the heel turn, the alleged heel turn has worked for AJ Styles. You know, it, it, it's amazing how that works. But yes, I, I enjoyed the main event. I thought AJ Styles was very, very good here. He carried Dean Ambrose to a respectable, at least, main event world title match. And I was happy when AJ Styles won the belt at the end of the night. You know, nut shot and all. Now he is truly the face that runs the place. Now there is actually a world champion on SmackDown that I find that I give two shits about. There is a champion on SmackDown that I actually think is worthy of that spot at this particular moment in time. A lot of respect for AJ Styles for coming to the WWE and being better to me than he ever has been. And it's not about the in-ring shit. It's about all the other stuff. I mean, he's worked on his mic skills. He's gotten better there. He's shown more versatility, flexibility, and desire to be different in terms of his character. I mean, I'm down with this version of AJ Styles. And I thought this was a really good way to end the night. You know, AJ hasn't been with WWE that long. But him winning the title here does not feel forced, does not feel rushed, does not feel like trying to cram somebody down the throat or a knee jerk reflex, reactionary move, or panic. I think WWE's done some good things. Yeah, they stubbed their toes a little bit with him when it came to Styles and Roman Reigns, stubbed their toes with him when it came to him and Jericho. Uh, but lately, they've done a lot better by him. The Cena program most certainly helped them. And now you've got the right guy with the right belt on the right show. So often the WWE makes bad choices and decisions and goes in the wrong direction. This is one of these rare instances today where the WWE makes the right decision and goes in the right direction with the right dude. Maybe it's because of the fact that I haven't paid attention to SmackDown in forever and I had a fresh perspective. Maybe it was because of coming off of that incredibly long, boring-ass, lame SummerSlam from a couple weeks ago. Uh, I didn't mind Backlash. I won't say this was a really good show or that I really truly enjoyed it, but I thought there were some good things here. I thought they made the right decision in terms of who they made the first women's champion, even though I felt they could have done things in a much different way that really should have spotlighted her a lot more effectively than what she ultimately was. Um, the Miz is in a perfect spot as the IC champion. I in particular did like the rib that they threw at CM Punk with that takedown combination him and Ziggler did at the beginning of the match. That shit had me fucking rolling for several damn minutes, period. Um, he, Slater, and Rhino, I, I thought that was funny. I thought it was, you know, well done. Um, and then AJ Styles winning the title here I thought was the right call. There were There were some encouraging things even though there were several things that I questioned or thought weren't done very well in this show. As far as, like I said, the matches all getting time, many of you will think that's a good thing. Uh, when all the matches tend to run a similar length and tend to be long, they all tend to feel the same. And that is part of the problem with the product today. It's a major problem is everything feels the same. From the performers, the characters, to the stories, to the mic work, to the in-ring action. Too much of it feels the same, and too much of the same ends up being lame. Good thing was, though, like I said, this show wasn't lame. I won't go out of my way to recommend anybody watch it, but if you've been a guy that's followed AJ Styles' career, if anything else, this was his night, and it was a night that he frankly deserved.